Welcome back to the channel. My name is Shadi Zayer, and in today's video, we're going to be doing a technical how to demonstration on how to use Identity Management 4.8's latest feature, the Form Builder. Now, in the past, the traditional method of creating a form or a provisioning request definition revolves a little bit uh, more in depth kind of coding knowledge and, and more micro focus specific knowledge. So, in the latest release of IDM 4.8, we've adapted an industry framework known as Form.io, and it's a really neat graphical interface, a drag and drop interface on creating some custom forms uh, that can really be used and get up and running rather quickly. Uh, I've seen a lot of different workflows that are very complex. I've even deployed some uh, in my past, you know, that around a custom kind of request portal or many custom processes. In today's video, we're going to be doing a rather simple one. I'm simply going to be creating a form that allows a manager to kick off a, a process to emergency disable a user. So let's say a user needs to be disabled. We can't wait on HR to put in that, you know, change on the attribute and, and flow throughout the system. A manager can go in or, you know, somebody from the technical IT team can go in and disable a user immediately and that would trickle to downstream systems. So really straightforward workflow, but it's going to expose or get us introduced to the new form builder experience, what that UI looks like. And hopefully from there, uh, we can we can build more intricate ones as well. So, you know, if you'd like to see more in-depth workflows created through this form builder, please drop a comment below and uh, we'll take that into consideration in some of the future versions of this. So to go ahead and get started, this video is going to be separated into two main parts. The first is the form builder and the second is the traditional workflow kind of process building uh, process behind that so that we can actually do fulfillment and and send it to the engine to actually disable the user so the first part here is creating a new form uh, in designer here so before we get into that just so you level set and you understand what my environment looks like it is rather simple we'll have some local machines running here running 4.8 and 3.6 i don't have a ton in this environment really uh, bare bones right now looking at building out more in-depth systems and things like that but this works really great for form building. So uh, that being said, I have designer 4.8 already stood up. And one of the things you should do before you get started in creating a form, and I'll provide a link into the documentation below on how, you know, where to find this file. But one of the things you need to do is navigate out to your installation folder or directory where designers installed. In my case, you'll see here, it's under the C drive, NetIQ. I'm in Windows, obviously. So you'll see that we ha I had to navigate to plugins here and the form builder plugin, specifically the library or lib commons directory. And from there, you need to open this file here, the service registry.json file, and you need to put this information in, the form's backend URL. Now I have a host file, My, you know, I don't have DNS set up on this machine, but this of course uh, forwards to a, an IP address. So you can put the IP address here as well. I'm putting the, the name here instead. But what this allows us to do is when you're creating the form, you can turn it online and start playing around and, and really mocking up the experience before you actually deploy it. Really cool feature there. So I'll show you how that works. But just so, you know, as we go through the demonstration, you can turn it on when I do and, and see how that works. So I've already saved this, already made that change, so it's already there. So I'm gonna minimize this, minimize this. We're back in designer. So <clears throat> from here, right, we've switched to the provisioning tab here, and the first thing we need to do is create a new form in the form builder. So what we can do here is do, click on request forms. That's the category that I'll be creating in. So there's a few different categories. You can use these as templates. That way you can reuse this type of form across many different workflows moving forward. So it's a cool way to categorize and, and a good way to, to reuse work rather than duplicate it. So if I right click here, click new, form identifier, I'm gonna create a sample one. So I'm gonna call this one user query because simply what we need to do in this form is query for a user object and that way we can pass it into the workflow engine and then disable a user. So I'm gonna create a sample user query form. Click finish here. And we'll see right away that the form builder here 
has opened up and this is the new interface for designing forms. So what you can do from here, right, you have a few kind of out of the box components that have been put in, but if you'd like to get started in using one that perhaps is already built out for you, you can click new form, select a template. The request form is a good one to get started with. And if I press create here, boom, we have a few more elements that have been introduced that are already built out for us. So when I asked you to do, or when I showed the service registry JSON file, we put in that information. This is the offline online toggle that I was talking about. When we click online, we get greeted with the OSP login page. I'm going to log in as UA admin and my password. Hopefully I get that right. There we go. And from here, as we navigate and build the queries, we can actually start using them and then interact with them as if this were already uh, deployed into the live environment. So we're going to do a few different things here. So this isn't just a request form. We're going to create one called user disable. So our emergency user disable. So from here, request form, I want to change that title. So all I need to do is simply edit it. We have a few different options here. You can duplicate it, paste it below, copy it, paste it somewhere else or delete it altogether. I'm going to edit it. Request form is my title here. We're going to name it emergency user disable. Now there's a lot of options here, right? From a, from a feature standpoint, this is simply just a title. So we're not going to do a lot of things here, but these are just some of the options available, right? From a data perspective, if you need to do something a little more dynamic, right? Refresh this field query out and change data. You can do that here. APIs, if you're calling this workflow over APIs, you can specify the property name. So that way, when you're wanting to kick off a workflow via API, you can pass in a specific property name and value, and that'll be passed into this workflow. So really friendly for developers and, and teams that are wanting to utilize these workflows to integrate with third party or, or downstream applications and processes. Lastly, the conditional, this is rather simple, right? This component must display X whenever the form component referencing another component shows a specific value and then you can get more complex there's some references here javascript with you know code syntax highlighting and those types of things and lastly logic so i don't have any logic configured but if i did we could add it and continue so i'm going to save this emergency user disable when i go to navigate it didn't refresh yet but uh, when i go to edit edit it we'll see that it shows emergency user disable here great so Per submit to request the entitlement, let's edit that as well. And we'll do to disable the selected user. And we're gonna save that one also. So you'll see here as I navigate the recipient, let's actually remove this particular field, delete this component, and I'm gonna add in a new field here. I'm gonna go here and we're gonna choose dynamic entity. So I'm gonna drag this over and you'll see this new experience, right? Rather than clicking and creating and having to define how the layout looks uh, via line breaks and things like that in the older interface, all I have to do is drag and drop. And I'm gonna drop it right there. So dynamic entity is the default title here. I'm gonna call this uh, select user. And you can specify where the label position is. Is there a placeholder, a description, tool tips, you can even specify, am I going to allow multiple values, allow reordering of those values once they've been you know, selected. You can disable it, add any type of data validation and those types of things. The data validation is here. So on change, we can specify anything specific and then uh, put in a custom error message. So this is rather straightforward, but if we go through here, right, the selected user, no choices to choose from yet. But if I go to data, and this is a huge pro, to choosing the online feature. So this actually uses the entities that exist in the DAL or directory abstract layer. So instead of having to, you know, remember the entity types and the names and things like that, I can simply reference the DAL straight from here and it brings in the entity key as well as attributes. So now I'm going to specify the attributes that I want to allow my query to search on. So I've just specified first and last name. And what it's already done is also specified the expression, display expression attributes. So super simple on specifying, right? I wanted to find a, a custom query, reference a specific DAL entity, and then the entity attributes that I want to search on. So 
And then of course that pre-populated the display expression attributes. Uh, from here, if you don't have these indexed, you know, in a larger environment, you may want to limit the results per page. So that way, you know, as you're searching, right, you don't do a large query, return a massive amounts of results. So you can limit that as well as some of the default value. What's the default value before a user selects anything and how often do you want to refresh? So we have some options here, or rather what elements you want to refresh on. So we're going to leave that blank. You can choose to encrypt these, index the database for searching functionality, all right from the form. So really, really user friendly on getting started and utilizing this. Now for the for the our workflow, for the function that we're trying to serve or the use case we're trying to solve here is simply to disable a user. We need to allow the end user to query for a user object and, and select them. So all we need to do is really define this dynamic entity component. Click save. Now we have select user. We're going to require a reason here. And then you have these buttons already populated here because we selected the request form template. So let's actually change that to user query so it reflects the name that I specified here. I'm going to save it and you can see here that it's actually saved locally before we deploy. But we're still online, right? So if I go over to preview and we see emergency user disable, you know, we, we see the interface that we, we designed here with the entity, the dynamic entity, the query, the reason. And if I click here, we'll see that it's already pulling in results. So these are some users that it suggests. I don't have many users in this environment, so we're really seeing most of the users there. And I'll click Ashley Black here. So we're seeing that the user's already been selected, and this is the exact interface that would appear in the user application. We haven't deployed yet, but we can see what it looks like, what the user experience would be. That way you can design this completely offline, You know, part of a kind of a DevOps process. We'll define it offline. Because we have integration with Git, you can commit this to a Git repository, have teams work on it and before it's actually deployed, and then lastly deploy it and, and turn it on, basically. So we can verify or validate the user experience. So really, really cool uh, from the form builder here. So I've already saved this, this form. So if I just minimize this, we saved it, and we'll go back. We This is where we defined all of those different things. So at this point, I can go ahead and close out. So what we want to do now is we see the user query here. I'm going to go ahead and do live deploy. So we see the success message. Now at this point, we can't actually utilize the new forms yet. It's not attached to a workflow yet. We've simply designed the front end, if you want to think of it that way. Now we need to define the back end or the kind of middle tier area where it'll interact with the workflow engine. So what we need to do now is something that you all may already be familiar with is actually define a new PRD. So if I click here, we'll do new. And I'm going to create a new identifier, a new PRD. Let's call this emergency user disable. And then we're going to make it look a little bit more friendly on the back, on the front end. Emergency user disable. In the description, we'll say this will allow you to select a user to be disabled. So the difference between these, the CN is what's stored in e-directory. The front end user doesn't necessarily see this. What they would see is the display name and then a brief description about what that workflow uh, would help them accomplish. So we're going to click next here. I'm not going to point this to any existing template, but if you did have a template that you're looking to replicate, you could choose that here. There's a few out of the box options, but we're just going to leave that as default category. We'll leave this under accounts simply because we're interacting with user accounts. Uh, you can create new categories here, or you could specify a custom category if you like. Trustee rights. I'm going to leave this open for the purpose of my demo environment. However, if we were specifying this for managers, you could have a manager group defined in e-directory and you could define them as a trustee list and then only managers and not end users would be able to kick off this workflow. So I'm going to go ahead and click finish. We'll see that the emergency user disable workflow has been created. And as we're interacting or, or seeing this, one of the things we need to do is first turn this to active. Now I've seen a lot of people getting started with workflows. They decide the they define the entire thing or design it, and then they go to deploy it, and they can't actually find it. And that's because the status is turned to inactive, and you can't interact with it in user app. So one of the first things we need to do is set that to active. 
single flow, the process, we can leave that all as default. One of the new features here is the JSON form selection. So that means this, and, and the tooltip explains it better than I could, this option allows you to choose a form that we built in Form Builder. So remember that user query form we built just earlier, by selecting this option, it allows us to choose that form to be the front end for this workflow. So if I go over to JSON forms, no form has been selected yet, and we need to define that for the start activity. So I'm gonna go define it. We're gonna choose user query. If I had an approval activity, maybe multiple approval activities, you could define the forms for those as well. I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Give it a little bit of time, there we go. So <clears throat> now it's saved, we've already defined the front end. Now we need to go back and define the back end. So from here, what I need to do is go into the workflow tab. And you know, the basic flow for a workflow is we go from start to finish, we define some new activities here to do things in the back end, in the downstream system, or in the workflow engine rather. So some of the things that you can do is first, let's make sure that we're defining the user properly. So from here, what we need to do is go over to properties. And what you'll see here is that we can enter things, add comments to ourselves, ensure that we're capturing the right data so that as we you know, call different activities, we were ensuring that the data has already been selected and we're passing the data correctly. So I like adding comments to my workflows, especially during the development phase, phase of this. Um, one of the things we need to do first actually is go to start and we'll see this tab data item mapping has two different options here pre activity if you wanted to pre populate any of these values and these values directly relate to the front end that we just defined earlier so select user that was that dynamic ent entity uh, selection that we did earlier the title was right emergency user disable so nothing really fancy there but if we wanted to pre-populate anything here we could definitely do that what we're mainly concerned about is the back end which means after a user has interacted with the start activity meaning the front end workflow from here we need to pass that data so we can interact with it and use it for these activities here so a real simple way to do that is just click map all and what you're doing here is defining the flow data from the front end from the form to a variable we can now access in the workflow process. So by clicking map all, it defines it all for you. Now, if you wanted to define specific variable names, you could do that as well. It's really okay as long as you're not defining multiple of the same variable, you know, you run to issues that way. So clicking map all is a really easy way to, to get started. So I'm gonna click save here. So now that we've mapped all of these different data items, what we can now do is start interacting with our log item here. So for the author, I'm going to just edit this. And the way that this appears is in a log activity, whether it's in the back end on the actual server in the Catalina log file, or as we'll see here, I'll show the, the comment in the front end. The author is kind of a, a way to say, you know, this is who enacted on this comment. So I'm just going to put UA for user admin. We're going to click OK here. What we'll do here is we'll say the selected user is, we'll put a space here, end quote, and then we're going to reference the selected user variable that we're getting from flow data. And that's really it. So I'm going to copy this because I'm going to put it both in the Catalina and on the front end as a comment. So if I click OK here, we're going to find that here. We'll go here, selected user is. We'll make sure we put a space here. We'll do plus so we can concatenate. And then we'll go on, select that variable. So really basic JavaScript here. Uh, this is ECMAScript or JavaScript. Really easy to get into. Tons of, of resources online where you can learn about JavaScript, practice those in a browser or, or in any other you know type of compiling that you can find online and really practice some of the code there. So we're able to really simply use some of these things here to get us the information that we need. So from here, I'll click Save again. <clears throat> so now what we want to do is actually pull in the entity activity. So what that means is the entity activity is a way for, in, for us to interact with an entity, in this case, a user. However, it could be different entities here. It could be a group. It could be a user. Perhaps it's a certain type of user, like a contractor or external user. 
All of these entities are defined in my DAL or the directory abstraction layer. So I've already defined one called workflow user. It's very similar to the user entity that's out of the box, but I like to define a separate workflow user entity. That way I'm not changing what is required or the different attributes to a, the out of the box user. You know, you, this way you don't run into any issues when you upgrade the environment or anything like that. So from here, we'll see my sample user entity and the attributes I've specified in that. If you'd like to see what entities I have defined, I'll just quickly go to that and show you what that looks like. Let me double click that. And the way that I did this is you can add a new entity and you can reference an existing entity. In, that, in this case, I referenced a user or the out of the box user entity. That way you can just bring over all of the different attributes or you could create one and then just reference the, uh, the other users or the other attributes that you need to bring in. In this case, I just brought in a few attributes of this entity you deploy the DAL or the directory abstraction layer, and then you're able to access it in the workflow. So really, really straightforward there. One of the things to be careful of is that when you define a new DAL entity, some of these values will be marked by default as multi-value. Just make sure and go through and ensure that some things are not multi-value where they shouldn't be. Things like CN, right? I shouldn't be multi-value. Email address, that makes sense. That could be multi-value. Full name is not, and so on. So you could define that. So if we go back here, I've defined the entity workflow user. Now the entity DN, this is the entity we want to actually modify. So again, remember I mapped all of the flow data or the attributes or variables rather from the front end. We need to plug that in and reference it here. So you can very simply click the dots here. Recipient by default, if you're you know using or populating the default variables, recipient is a default variable. In this case, we're going to go to start user query and select user. So now we're going to be feeding in the DN that the user selected on the front end. So the difference, I get this question sometimes, the difference between flow data start and start object. If you have multiple values here in the start, so let's say, uh, you know, one of the options we allowed on the front end was the end user can select multiple users. So we saw Ashley Black being selected whenever we were testing. If they selected Ashley, they selected Bob and Carol, that comes in as an object. So then we can iterate through that object through a for loop. We kind of build a for loop here um, is, is the way I like to reference it and, and think of it. And we can iterate through that object and find the DN or the DN values and iterate through those. And, and then you can disable all those users. So the objects are really used for multi-valued uh, type scenarios. In this case, we're not worried about that. We're just going to stick to the basics here and just do the, the one dimensional or one user object here. So if I click OK here, we're going to reference, we're going to pass in that DN. And what we want to do here is actually just modify the login disabled attribute. So we're going to replace the value here. And I'm going to change this to true. So by default, the login disabled attribute is set to false unless they were, uh, you know, locked out for whatever reason. They've input a, their password wrong too many times and we've already locked that account. But by default, the login disabled attribute is set to true. So what or to false. So what we want to do now is set that to true when a user comes into this workflow, specifies the user they want to disable, and we just pass it to the workflow engine, say we want to replace the existing login disabled attribute, whatever that value is, with true, and now they'll be unable to log in. Uh, one of the things that you can also do, so that way this workflow looks good whenever you actually submit it, is bring in this activity here to workflow status, and then just do workflow status approved. If you wanted to see some of the other out of the box options, just go to workflow status here and approve and denied are really the only options here. But if you don't do this, then when a user submits this, the way it appears in the interface is that the workflow was denied, which is not the case in this scenario. So we just want to make sure that it's consistent from a user uh, perspective. So I'll click OK here, click Save, and then we'll go and deploy. Live deploy. OK. Just saying that that workflow was dependent on it. We'll see it doesn't exist in the user app yet. We've deployed all these different things here, no errors, everything's looking good. So again, 
created the form, selected the JSON form selection, our status is set to active. We go to JSON forms, we select the front end, the form that we created, and then we designed the workflow piece. So if I go over to my interface here, I have user app already up and running. This is also pretty cool. This is a new feature of IDM 4.8 where you can extend your session, brings up a new login, and that way you can resume your workflow here. So I'm gonna go in, let's actually just create a new featured item. Emergency, I'm gonna search for that. Okay, let's add it. You can add an image if you want. We can do that at a later time. Edit done. Emergency user disabled. It's gonna kick off that front end here. Oops, looks like my session was bad, but that's okay. Let's go back here and go to access request emergency user disable here we are we're gonna feed in Ashley Black here provide the reason needs to be disabled immediately click submit request was sent successfully now we can go to access request history we'll see the emergency user disable approved here so that's because of the status that we put in we can click on it and this is that comment that we provided with the author UA it says the selected user is CNA black users and data and then we see that the user has been sent to the provisioning service so I already have Apache directory studio up here and we see that the login disable set to false if I go and refresh this we see that login disabled has been set to true so very straightforward, very easy. The new form builder is an excellent feature that we've added in to help our community, help the users and partners and implementers, professional services, get these new forms up and running really quickly, and they look really great. There's a lot of new elements, a lot of new activities or uh, layouts that you can design, and the ceiling is it's endless. And, and what's really great about this is now when you're designing some of these, what used to be more custom workflows, they're much more in the box now and will be supported in future upgrades. So thank you so much for sitting through this. Hopefully you found that valuable. This was an introduction to the new IDM 4.8 form builder. If you'd like to see a more in-depth analysis on how these, uh, how these pieces work or we create a more in-depth workflow, please feel free to reach out to me and, <clears throat> and leave a comment and we'll get to that. We can, there's documentation links in, in the description, as well as more information on how you can get started. So thank you so much. Be sure to like and subscribe. We'll be putting out new content like this as we see in the field or as per customer requests and comments on, on our YouTube channel. So thanks again so much. Have a great day and thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.